My name is Jim Rose Bush and I'm founder and CEO of a company called Growth Strategy. And what I do is I act as the outsourced growth strategist for family offices, high net worth individuals, and on the sell side, managers that are particularly interested in the family office side. I started my career 35 years ago working for one of the early family offices, uh, the founders of General Motors. And so that really gave me the bug for working with families and really figuring out how they protect their assets and, and grow them in perhaps more creative strategies. And also they had me involved in running their philanthropic initiatives. So that led me to do a number of things, including ultimately going to work in the Reagan White House and opening up the president's first office on philanthropy, promoting effective philanthropy, which then in turn has led me more recently to announce the launch of a new fund called Intersection Impact Fund, which combines investment strategy and philanthropic strategy. It's the first fund of its kind, which is designed specifically for millennials who want to become philanthropists, but they don't want to give up a major share of their assets in a donor advised fund or in a private foundation. So they can keep their money, their control of it, and watch it grow, while at the same time, 25% of the upside goes into the philanthropic pot or the philanthropic side by side. So they can be activists on the philanthropic side by keeping control of their assets. I'm here today at the deal ring as a coach for managers. So I coach the managers on how to make the winning pitch to asset allocators that are here as well. So my, my personal passion in what I'm doing now is, as you can tell, on the social impact side because working with millennials, as I do, so many of them are in California, but really all over the world, now they've come into control of a significant amount of money which they are impatient about. They want to see it not only achieve investment-like returns, but social impact returns as well. And it's something that gives me hope for the future of the world because uh, money is being deployed in a way that creatively and effectively brings solutions in areas such as healthcare, nutrition, the environment, uh, and they, they don't want to just throw money at these issues and these causes. They want to see a return on investment, so to speak, and they want to see that the kids' lives are being saved, that diseases are being addressed and reduced. That And one of the exciting areas that I'm involved in is with pediatric uh, care and the development of solutions and devices that accelerate healthcare solutions for young children. And investors are increasingly interested in this because they can work alongside clinicians in hospitals to create uh, investment funds that bring these devices and solutions to com the commercialization stage and to market and to application much faster. So I'm very, very excited about this intersection or this combination of investors, uh, investment strategy, and philanthropy. And that's something that is a strong personal passion of mine, uh, along with my growth strategy business of working, as I say, with families, family offices, and with managers, uh, so on the buy side and the sell side, and also a strong orientation to philanthropy. As is said, once you've seen one family office, you've seen one family office. And everyone is very intrigued, particularly managers are very intrigued by the whole family office structure. There are new family office associations that are forming. Uh, however, the definition of a family office is, is also very broad because there are uh, investment firms, trust companies, uh, groups of individuals that call themselves a family office, their family offices that are raising money rather than just managing assets. Uh, when you call a family office conference, and I have and I've spoken at many, uh, at a lot of them, you find that family offices are just defined in different ways. It could just be a group of people united in the protection and investment of their assets. But the original family office, of course, was created to protect one family's assets, that the people that are actually related to each other in a multi-generational setting. So even in that traditional 
in that traditional model, you see a lot of disruption today because now a lot of the wealth is being transferred in the greatest migration of wealth to the next generation in, a, in world history. So you see, I think, $41 trillion or more. Recently, I heard it was even estimated at, at $66 trillion is migrating from the wealth creators to the millennials. And increasingly, as they get control of it, they want to kind of revise and change some of the operating rules of family offices. They want to bring other families in uh, to co-invest with them at a minimum. And there are all kinds of aberrations of family offices today. So I would say that, you know, just like in every sector of our economy, there is significant disruption from our political economy to every sector of the economy and the family office sector is not exempt from that. Well, it's remarkable to me that with all the significant disruption around the world and the shrinkage of American influence and power around the world that there's as much stability as there is. Because I would say given the objective of China to take control of the world economy by 2043 and given the state of uh, in Europe immigration and its impact on the European economy, the potential withdrawal of the UK uh, from uh, the European economy, uh, from uh, what's going on in Africa, in North Africa in particular, in the Middle East. Uh, probably every single, and, and Latin America is not exempt either, so probably every political economy is in complete disruption. Now, that in one sense you could say that that just um, increases the value of the dollar and the, the, uh, so, you know, the, the gold standard, you could say, of the U.S. economy and the dollar. However, the U.S. economy struggles as well uh, with acute underemployment, um, with uh, absolutely intolerable levels of debt, um, and this, this hasn't really been much of a relief either, the U.S. economy. However, I think because it's the only place we can go is the U.S. economy, and I'm speaking of people from abroad as well, uh, it's, it's kept us humming along. So it's, it's something every day I take a deep breath and say, you know, what, what could happen next? So what we need more than anything else is we need stability and promise for the future. And this is really something that can really only be offered by the, uh, the leadership of a country where the government gets out of the way, lets the private sector do its job because the government can't create jobs. The government cannot create economic stability outside of managing uh, the money flow. And we've seen attempts to do that over the past several years. And it's sort of at a, at a stage where, you know, the Fed is saying, well, what can we do next? And I think that it's remarkable that we have as much stability as we can. I think the most, one of the most interesting factors in investment strategy today is that the, in the alternative space, which we define, I think, differently today than we would have 20 years ago, 10 years ago in terms of hedge funds, um, investors are cr having to create all kinds of new strategies and structures themselves, particularly, for example, in the area of real estate debt financing, the fact that we've got today the, the entrance and the development of, of the whole industry in self-financing in, and in um, uh, investors coming together in, in groups uh, to invest in and, and, and really support um, real estate development. I, I think that's fast. I'm, I'm very interested in that and I've put as a matter of fact, some of my clients into those structures, which are very rewarding uh, investment-wise and I think relatively secure. So um, I think that the disruption is really causing people to seek additional alternatives that uh, can just, where they can either at least maintain or grow their assets, not to the degree that we've been able to do perhaps in the past in some sectors, but uh, at, a, at a reasonable rate. My advice for managers that are looking toward asset allocators is to remember that if you have a good idea without the ability to communicate it, you're lost. 
And if you have the ability to communicate, but you don't have the substance and the strategy that has the performance behind it, that can really win the allocations, you're lost as well. So today, what we've been trying to do is really develop the innate talents and skills of investors and to help coach them in a way that they're really putting their best foot forward with allocators in a competitive environment. So we, we have a lot of fun here uh, at the deal ring and uh, it, it's just, it's thrilling to me to work with managers to take their data, their, their methodology and say, well, how could that be said more effectively in a winning way in the context of competition? So very exciting. I, I love being a part of it.